Hello and welcome to the F-Rated podcast. I'm Holly Tarquini. I'm the founder of the F-Rating. And I'm broadcaster and journalist Anu Anand. And this is episode five of our podcast. The F rating, in case you don't know, is a feminist film rating awarded to all films written and or directed by women. And if it also stars women, then it's triple F rated. If you'd like to see a list of nearly 26,000 F rated films, just put F rated as a keyword into IMDb. And Holly, today we are speaking to someone, of course, who really embodies the F rating. We're talking to screenwriter Gabby Chappie. Now, Gabby is an experienced TV writer. She's written extensively for long running series like Family Affairs, Doctors, EastEnders, Casualty, Survivors, lots of other series as well. And her first feature film, Their Finest, came out in 2017. It was previewed at Film Bath Festival, as was her second film, Misbehaviour, which came out in 2020, one week before lockdown. Oh my gosh, Gabby, welcome. Hi, hi. Hi, Gabby. I'm so chuffed to have you on, not least because both your films are triple F rated. Oh, excellent. (laughs) And have a good, strong feminist bent to them. So very lovely to have you here. And and Gabby, I watched Misbehaviour yesterday. We'll be talking about the film, but I mean, really, not just a feminist film, but so intersectional, so refreshingly intersectional. So I'm I'm not surprised at all it got such a high F rating. Gabby, let's start with questions from students at Screenology in Bristol. We also talked to kids who are part of the group Into Film. And we wanted to find out what they wanted to ask you in preparation uh, for this conversation. And of course, the number one question, because, you know, of course, they're at this point in their lives, is how did you get into your profession? So so let's start with that, because I think I'm right in saying you studied archaeology. I studied archaeology and then changed to English, but um, it's not a very clear path. So it's a slightly how long have you got when I talk about how I got into what I'm doing. I don't think when I was young, it ever occurred to me that you could be a writer of television. I thought TV and film, I watched a lot of TV and a lot of films on TV. And I think I always thought of the actors were just embodying the whole thing for me. So when I thought about how attracted I was to telly and film, I thought I wanted to be an actor. And for a long time, I thought I wanted to be an actor. But I now think that's just because that's all I saw. That's the tip of the iceberg. That's the visible bit. And I identified very strongly with the characters I saw as well. So I now I get irritated that people think the actors are making up as they go along. But at the time, when I was younger, that's sort of how I received TV and film. Um, when I was a student, I studied archaeology. Then I changed to English. I did a lot of acting. I did a lot of theatre at university. I was really taken up with that. And when I left, I was part of a women's theatre company called Trouble and Strife. We wrote our own plays because there weren't any plays that we wanted to perform. That writing was part became more and more part of it. Then I tried to write a novel, which again, I felt very passionately about. But astoundingly, having read so much over the years, because I read a lot as well as watched a lot of telly, I just couldn't do it. I just didn't know how the engineering of a novel worked. I would consumed them in huge quantities, but I couldn't reproduce that. But interestingly, when I came to, I got a break, a friend of mine was working for Family Affairs, which was a now defunct soap on Channel 5, where they gave very new writers a break, probably because they paid them so little. <laughs> The first time I tried to write telly, I realised that actually I could reproduce that. I did understand the engineering. I really understood the grammar. So I still don't know why all the telly and film I watched soaked into me and became something I understood. I got the rhythms and I got it, whereas novels just didn't, couldn't do it. When I started doing it, I do remember this sort of rush of excitement of thinking, I can do this. I really want to do this. I really want to do this. And I was pregnant with my first child, which is mostly when people are starting to ease off their their careers. And I just thought, I've just found this thing and it makes sense of all the other things I've done, all the other things I've tried to write, all the interest in theatre, all of that, all of that suddenly coming together in this one thing. And here I am, eight months pregnant. 
Gabby, I know there's a, there's already a lot there, but I know that Holly and I really want to hear more, don't we, about Trouble and Strife, the feminist theatre company. How how did you get into that, and what what was that like? Oh, it's gosh, it's so long ago now. We were students, and there was a feeling that in a university which produced lots and lots of theatre, I, I went to Cambridge, and there were there's a lot of money available to students, societies of all sort. So loads of theatre was being produced. Very little of it felt like it was about women or I played, usually played boy parts when I, when I was cast. I was often cast as just sort of, yeah. And what, what kinds of stories? What, what did, did you feel was missing? Well, we did a lot, there was a lot of classical work, there was a lot of Shakespeare. There just wasn't work where either women got the chance to act as women, although this, those chances were few and far between. Or they just weren't about what was happening then, you know, didn't or weren't addressing what it felt like to be who we were, which was in our late teens and early twenties, in the mid eighties. Um, and I left and did carried on doing theatre. I was doing fringe theatre because I was a little bit older than the other women in the group. And then Abigail Morris, who is the director who went on to work in the Soho Theatre, said, "We're going to we, we want to take it professional. Do you want to do you want to?" join us so I did so we spent a few years I was with the company we wrote two plays they wrote another one afterwards they were varied but they were all about women and aspects of being female that we felt wasn't really being tackled at the time the first play was called now and at the hour of our death and it was about the no wash protest in Armagh prison at the same time as the men were on hunger strike and no wash there was a women's protest which was sort of forgotten because of the attention was focused on the men we then we did a play called next to you i lie about pornography which in fact had a revival of two or three years ago and i was surprised at how surprised pleased but also very depressed at how relevant it still felt and then when i left they did a play about mother and baby homes re-watching misbehavior and their finest i felt that they were both incredibly relevant one set in the 40s one set in the 70s still so much of the battle to come. But there were two things I wanted to pick up on. The first is one of the reasons that we're doing this podcast is because I think, especially for young people, what you said about you can only see the actors or the director. So they're the kind of roles in film that you know about. And so often you find when you talk to young people that want to work in film, that's what they focus on because that's what they can see. And we want to unveil the myriad of positions that there are in film and how different they all are and the skills that are different. And the other thing was that you talked about how you intuitively knew how to write for television and film. And I'm really, really interested in that because every time I speak to any screenwriters, they tell me that writing, especially for film, is incredibly technical, that you kind of, you have to get it right so that it makes simple sense. Yeah, I'm not saying I was I'm not saying I was great at it first off. I think what I'm trying to say is I just understood the language that was being spoken. I understood when I was there were too many words on the page. I understood that a scene felt too long. It was more like a sense of I'm a really bad dancer, but it was more like a sense of rhythm. I understood something needs to change now, something needs to happen now. I need to be outside now that I've been inside. So it was more to do with understanding how those rhythms worked and it felt intuitive rather than learned. Everything else has been learned since then. So it's like something that kind of made sense to me intrinsically, so you can learn it. Whereas I did a disastrous physics A-level. I never I, I never understood physics. I don't know what I was thinking. But I could never learn it because I just didn't get any of the principles. It's just not how I see the world. So everything was like learning in a foreign language. Whereas when I got to TV and film, I felt like, no, this I understand this. I understand this. I just need to get better at it. So, Gabby, um, you talked about how you ended up writing the script for Family Affairs, this ITV uh, series. How, how did that actually come about? Because in 1997, you moved from London to Leeds, which is a bit of a reverse of what most people do. How did the actual op- opportunity to write a TV script come about? Well, a friend got me the break. So somebody I knew because we'd worked together in theatre. So, you know, she was a friend that I'd made because we shared the same interests. We both liked theatre. We both liked acting. We both liked writing. 
she went and started working in TV. She got a job on Family Affairs as she was writing scripts for Family Affairs. They were looking for writers and she said, oh, you should, I, I know somebody who I think would be good, but she hasn't got a script to send you because everybody always wants a calling card because she's been writing with a women's theatre group and they, they write by consensus. So there's not only just writing together, there's five of them in a room and they, they write by consensus, which basically meant whoever had the energy to argue longest on that day carried the moment. But it was a really interesting way to work. At the time, we thought politically we should write like that. Anyway, so you see, don't, don't, she's not, got nothing to show you, just give her a chance. And they did. So I was really, really lucky. And I owe my career to Paula Webb, who said, give her a break. And then once I got it, it all fell into place. So that's a terrible thing to, I know that people listening are going to be going, oh no, it's a friend. That's just, I don't want to hear that. There are other ways of doing it. I don't know then how else. I would have done it, but now I think there are more official openings. There are more courses you can be doing. There are more chances. So, yeah, I think that's true. And often, from a programming perspective, because I run a film festival, we're often talking about who programs the films. So, who selects the films that we watch at film festivals in independent cinemas? And are all those people that are choosing the films of one specific type, which tends to be male, pale and stale. And if they are, how do we shift that? And there's lots and lots and lots of programs for young programmers to get into the industry, but then it doesn't really follow through after that. And I think that's probably similar in screenwriting, that there are probably lots of courses and programs for younger people to do, but whether that has started and is properly then feeding into the system without those contacts um, I don't know. I think it's really fraught how you how you make those opportunities stick. Yeah, and and also we've been talking a lot about feeling that you have the privilege to do it. not not the privilege to do it, but the kind of the right to do it. Yeah, I, I went to Cambridge, which makes me very lucky and very privileged, and it did give me a huge boost. But part of that was the confidence because I got there from a state school. And I didn't have imposter syndrome, actually. I got there and thought, oh my God, if my sixth form had gone to the schools that these people had gone to, we'd all be here. So in fact, although there were some really amazingly clever people there, there were also a lot of people there that I just thought were there because of the kind of education they'd had. And actually, that's what gave me the confidence is I thought, no, not only can I compete, most of my school could, or half my school could have done if they'd wanted to, if they'd been given the same breaks. And it's also the thing that made me so, I went from being somebody who came from a place where I consumed culture to going to university with people whose parents maybe worked for the BBC or did so, who, from people who made culture. And I suddenly realised that was actually possible. There are other things that have the same effect, I think, is that you need to be given the opportunity to think, oh, no, I can make, I can make this. And it can happen in lots of different ways. And for me, it was the university I went to and the, the sort of doors that opened for me and the way it changed, the way I saw how things were working as well. So, Gabby, let me bring in uh, some of the questions that we've had from the students. And, and obviously you transitioned from TV into film. And let's talk about your first film. Um, it's their finest. And for those who haven't seen it, Katrin Cole is the main character. She's played by actress Gemma Arterton. And she joins the Ministry of Information to write, I love this word, slop. And this is the this is the women's dialogue for these propaganda films. And then she ends up working on a feature with a character played by Bill Nighy. Can you talk us through a little bit, first of all, of how you adapted the book that was written by Lissa Evans? How was that approach different, perhaps, to writing a screenplay from scratch? So their finest hour and a half, which is Lissa's book, the main process I think I went through was actually deciding what to leave out because it's a very rich, multi-layered, multi-stranded book. And what happened through subsequent drafts was you, you're finding the shape of the feature film within that. You have to re-engineer. I always 
think that adaptation is an act of re-engineering or trans it's more like translation you're translating it from one genre to another genre and the ad advantage if you like or the thing that adaptation gives you is that you have source material to which you have a uh, an emotional response otherwise you wouldn't be doing it that gives you energy and in fact what you end up doing is trying to keep the spirit of what you loved about it what you loved about reading that book while re-engineering it restructuring it making it into something different it's as you know making a novel into a film is a bit like making a novel into a poem it's a very very different genre and you do have to translate an awful lot of things but what you're generally trying to do is preserve the spirit okay so let me let me just put to you a couple of specific questions so this is a question from Mia and she asks what is your daily creative practice oh Mia that is such a brilliant question and I tell you what all writers are absolutely obsessed with other writers creative daily practice what you do that's what we ask each other when we meet so I'm quite disciplined. I get to my desk and I try not to leave it. It just sort of depends on the kind of work I'm doing. When I'm writing, actually writing a script, I just sit at my desk and I keep keep going and try and get through the pages because it's just a matter of how many hours you put in. So I'm disciplined and I can do that. But the thing that I find hardest to manage is my own state of mind. So it's almost like a, men it's a mental health issue. You're spending loads of time on your own, doing work which is quite technical, but living in a completely imaginary world that only you inhabit, unless it's actually being made, in which case that gets slightly easier. And when it, my work is going well and what I'm writing feels alive, I am really, really happy. When it's going wrong and it just feels like something that has no reality, it has no life to it, it just feels dead, I'm really miserable. So it's... <laughs> so creatively, I get to my desk, I sit here, sometimes I have a swim first when the swimming pools are open or when it's warm enough to swim outside, and then I work. And I spend a lot of time trying to manage my state of, yeah, my state of mind. I know this to be true. The only thing that does it is putting in the time. And I know sometimes I put in the time, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and suddenly it all comes together. But it never all comes together if I haven't put in the hours first. So that leads perfectly onto a question that came from Maisie. And Maisie asks, how can someone get over bad writer's block, especially in COVID or lockdown times? It's also a really good question, Maisie. OK, there's two things. It's hard to have writer's block when somebody's paying you to deliver work. It's possible, but it's harder you've got a sort of fear of not delivering on a deadline and it's your career. So there's a sort of spur in that that actually can get you through most things. However, when I've tried to write something just for myself, I hit writer's block quite badly and it's, it's always surprises me that I can't, doesn't seem to be a transportable skill that I take from career to writing I want to do that nobody's paying me for and it's just experimental. And what I try and do is break it down into really tiny things, give myself little tiny tasks. So to get over writer's block, somebody once told me you should never polish at the end of a day. You should always leave what, you're, what you've written unfinished so that you've got something to get purchase on. I used to like leaving everything tidy. I'm quite a tidy person, tidy my desk, tidy my paragraph. But actually, if you leave the work a mess, then you've got something to respond to the next day and you think, oh, that's really bad. And before you know it, you're making it better. When it's happened to me, I've set myself really tiny little tasks like describing what I see outside the window. I think for me, when there's a block, the block is often the size of what I wish I could do or the, the hugeness of what I wish I could say. And so the best thing is to say something really tiny or just do something small. That's my way out of it when it happens to me. That's such good advice. That sounds so useful. <laughs> I was just thinking, yeah, leave the mess for the next morning when you have the energy. This is a question, um, Gabby, about a film and the different kinds of roles. This is a question from Rianne. And she says, how much power does a screenwriter have after they write the script? So through production, post-production, distribution, or is it just totally out of your hands at that stage? Are we talking about feature films here? Yes. I think it really depends on the circumstance of 
the film. So I've only had the experience of being involved in two feature films. And with both of them, I felt very consulted by the director. Both directors were women. And Misbehaviour was co-written with Rebecca Frain. So I didn't write that on my own. But any power I've had in that has been given to me out of courtesy. But actually, no, I don't think you have any real power, unless you're also an executive producer. Um, so you can be, you could have a really horrible experience. I've spoken to writers who've had the experience of feeling completely pushed off their own work. And so it can happen and there's no, guarantee, there's no guarantee it won't. And film, feature film as it stands now as a director's medium, it's a difficult one to protect yourself against, I think. I feel so, like I've been lucky so far, but it's luck, not it's not um, enshrined. So can you tell us a bit more about those? Because you've worked with two fantastic directors. I mean, two, I've only worked on two feature films, but worked with the two directors that you've worked with is... is... I know, right? Yeah, tell us about them. Um, so Lona Scherfig, who directed Their Finest, and Philippa Lothorpe, who directed Misbehaviour, they're very different. But what is interesting about them is that, I mean, they're different, they're very different people, but they both run very calm film sets, and they're both very, very respectful of writers in a way that I think has made both those working relationships incredibly happy. They're both very, very meticulous as well. You'd get, if it wasn't working, you'd get notes and notes and notes and notes until it was working. And it's, but I enjoy that process of a director saying, I need this, I need this, I need this. No, I need more of that. I need more of that. Not being prescriptive about how you will achieve that, but just saying, no, no, I need more. I need more. Can it be funnier is obviously my least favourite note. It's most writers' least favourite. Could this be funnier? You think, well, if it could, it would be. But in fact... It's at least they're saying, do you know what? I think they're not saying we need a joke here. And I think this is the joke. They're saying we need some, we need some lightness here. We need to, we need this to sing a bit at this moment. And both, both films are really funny. I love the humour in, in both films because it's, it doesn't get at anyone. Neither of them are kind of attacking or making fun humour, are they? They're both inclusive humour oh that's really good to hear I, I think people are really funny I think if you listen to people on the street at any length of time just in a bus stop people are really funny the average person average conversations make you laugh and I just think that's why wouldn't you reflect that well, Gabby, let's bring in your second film um, which I really thoroughly enjoyed I mean, I, I was yeah, Misbehaviour is a film set in the 90s in 1970, actually, not in the 1970s, but in the year 1970. And it's the Miss World Beauty Pageant. It's about to be hosted in London. And a group of feminists decide to disrupt it. And, and it's got this wonderful cast. You've got Keira Knightley playing the main character. She's quite intellectual, middle class. She's studying history. She's got a TV. She's divorced, you know, but her co-protesters are sort of living in a commune, you know, sort of like your, your theater group sharing everything, sharing the money, sharing the work. Uh, and then you've got this incredibly international palette of women, these contestants who have their own burdens that they're, they're dealing with, whether it's race, South Africa, apartheid, uh, opportunity. And then you've got the men as well, including Bob Hope, who is coming to host this big event. So how, first of all, did you manage all of that in a script? I mean, that is an awful lot to get in. Oh, that's the whole way to get in. And that was the work that Rebecca, that's down to Rebecca Frame. She started it and she managed to marshal. I mean, where do you, when you're adapting life, even though it's an event, but it is life. Where do you start? Where do you stop? What do you, what do you include? What don't you? So the extraordinary thing that I think she did was manage to find a shape that allowed all the things you describe to exist. So focusing on the competition, the actual competition itself, but making sure that those extraordinary streams that were feeding into it, it felt like, you know, it gave it a shape because life is chaos, which is why we have stories because stories make chaos somehow meaningful and make it into patterns. But actually life is chaos, stories are not, you know, you hear amazing things, but stories aren't really naturally occurring. They need to be shaped. 
And it's really hard to shape life into a story without making it feel too neat, too tidy, you know, like you're shoehorning stuff in. It's a really difficult job. And I think she did it, you know, amazingly. That was her, not me. Fair enough. This actually, this question from Mia again is is really relevant um, to the characters in your film. Uh, how do you manage to round out the characters? How do you make them real without, you know, trying so hard that they effectively become artificial? Well, Philippa Lothorpe, who directed it, she's got a kind of mantra which she keeps keep saying to me, Gabby, the truth is our friend, the truth is our friend. So she also directed Three Girls, which um, she won a BAFTA for, about the child abuse grooming scandal. And that was based on the experiences of real women and the incredibly traumatic experiences, well, girls, children, real, of real people. And so her view on how you use reality and how that becomes story. You shape it as much as you have to, to make it hold together as a story that you can tell. And sometimes you have to leave things out and sometimes you have to introduce things so that people understand what's happening. But then you mine as much of the reality from people, what people have said to you, what people have told you, as you possibly can. It's like a sort of process where you flick between engineering, you engineer the structure, and then you clothe it in the flesh of truth, you know, little bits of truth that people have told you. And then you have to re-engineer it. And then you clothe it some more in the details of their lives that people have, have told you. So, so there's something in the soundscape, just to flick back to the other film, Their Finest, where one of the things that when you're reading testaments from the Second World War, one of the things that you, I hadn't heard before was people saying, all you can hear is the sound of broken glass being swept up every day, all the time during the Blitz. It, that was the sound of the Blitz to them. It wasn't the sirens, wasn't the bombs. It was the broken glass being swept up on the pavements. And that was, in the, that was fed into the soundscape of that film. So it's all that, those little bits of truth. So let me ask you another one, Gabby. Uh, this question is from Dominique. How do you find the topics that you are best suited to writing? I don't know if you do this. Do you filter? But she wants to know, how do you find the stuff that you think you are best placed to tell? That's a very good question. I do filter now. When I started, I would have been grateful for any job. And I found that if I put enough effort in, I came to love and care about anything I wrote, even if it's not something that would have been my taste. Now, I wouldn't write something I wouldn't myself watch because that you just end up being cynical because if it's not your taste, you don't understand why people love it. So it will, it will just be a cynical exercise. Now what happens is I, I, I do get lots of stuff sent to me and I read it and think, yeah, yeah, I can see that as a film or I can see that as telly, but it doesn't spark anything in me. Whereas the things that I really want to do, I have like a very physical reaction to it. it's a bit like fancying somebody it's a bit like your heart beating fast and you think oh god please don't let this be taken please don't let somebody else be doing this I want this so badly but what I would do if I were you Dominique is look at films or look at certain ideas or almost put them in front of you and see if you have a reaction to them do you think oh god yeah that really excites me or do you think eh, mm, yeah you do have an emotional reaction to work which is not to say that you can't also work your way into caring, because I've done that too, but I don't have to anymore. Which is great. So, Gabby, the last question that I wanted to ask you was, if you could travel back to your younger self, are there nuggets of advice that you would want to give to the young Gabby? What would you say to her? Oh, uh, I don't know. Not, not even don't do a physics A-level. Not even that, because I think failing... <laughs> Is a really useful thing to learn. I think all the things that bad and good that happened to me probably feed in. They're the compost from which this comes from, what I do now. And I think if I told my younger self that I would write television that would actually be on television and films that would actually be in the cinema, I wouldn't have believed it. And I would have been so blown away by the idea. Um, so, yeah, I know, I don't think there is anything I could say. But maybe that's all you'd want to say is, it's going to be great. Yeah. 
No time machine for you, Gabby. That That's nice, actually. It's nice to hear. It's sort of like it's as it should be. Gabby Chappie, thank you so much for making time to speak to us. Uh, it's just been an amazing insight into the world of screenwriting. And of course, we also just want to thank the students from Screenology and Interfilm who've put all their questions to you. Thank you so much. Oh, it was brilliant. Thank you so much, Gabby. Thank you. Right. Well, that was one of the first conversations we recorded. And yeah, the, the audio settings were a little bit ropey. I Thank you for persevering. Uh, we've learned a lot since then. And it really takes nothing at all away from Gabby, who just goes from strength to strength, Holly. She really does. She's got a new Netflix series. Um, she's adapted the book and she's also writing original episodes for The Beast Must Die. Yeah, it looks really, really interesting. It's about a woman who infiltrates the the life of uh, her daughter's murderer. Um, and if you haven't seen Misbehaviour, I mean, honestly, one of my all time favorites. Watch the films, but look, here's our ask. You get these awesome insider film conversations with women for free. You get all these amazing and meaningful film recommendations. Thank you, Holly. All we want for this unpaid effort um, is simply for you to hit like and to share the podcast with others because it really helps us get a little bit more exposure. It tells us that you valued what we're doing, what we're putting hours and hours of our time into. And of course, it helps the women that we're speaking to get more exposure. So it's all win-win. It really is. And next time we have a huge treat for you all. We're speaking to Ama Asante, who is one of the only, and I'm not even joking, black female directors working in Britain at the moment. And she is so phenomenally talented that we had to wait two years to get an interview <laughs> with her. We, we did, but it's so worth it. And, and when she did give us her time, she spoke for so long and so freely. And it was so interesting that actually we've had to split it up into two fantastic packed episodes. And in the first one, we'll hear a lot about how she started out and what her early journey was. It is really, really fascinating. I felt like she really opened her heart and opened her life to us and she's packed with wisdom. So that is going to be a fantastic episode. Please, please do join us for that next time. And thanks so much for listening. 